Daniel chapter 6. I want to speak a brief word of exhortation this evening. This is a weekend when so many have chosen to go to New York City to participate there in the events relative to Pride Weekend. And while I don't necessarily have a problem with all that, I don't necessarily endorse it either. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be right where I am. Amen. I'm glad to be in the house of God. I'd rather be here than anywhere I know. Amen. And that's not just something to say. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And I'm so glad tonight that God has given us a place and given us a fellowship and given us uh, the opportunity to come into His presence. What an honor. What a thrill. What a joy. What a privilege. And in my mind, uh, everybody that's a part of this fellowship should be here right now. Amen. In my spirit, I believe everybody that's part of this fellowship should be here right now. Because while they're in New York City watching this parade of all too often decadence and sinfulness and godlessness going out down the street in front of them, they could be here enjoying what we're enjoying. Amen. They could be here feeling what we're feeling. They could be here uh, getting hold of God like we're getting hold of God. But praise God, I hope as time goes by that we'll be able to help every believer in this congregation to come to a place of consecration and dedication in their experience with God where they too will realize that this is where they ought to be. Amen. Praise God. And amen. If you have your Bible open to Daniel chapter 6, I'd like to begin reading at verse 1, actually. And I'm reading tonight from the King James Version, the Old Faithful. And it reads in this fashion. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and hundred and twenty princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over, the, uh, over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give account unto them, and the king should have no damage or loss. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius lived forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes and counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save or accept of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, that's an important thing to remember. Amen. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, 
regardeth not the king, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. I'm going to stop reading there for now, and I want to speak to you tonight on the topic of looking down the lion's throat. Amen. And would you bow your head and pray with me tonight that the Lord will bless his message, his messenger, and those that would hear. Master, tonight as we come into your presence and we feel such a wonderful move and anointing of your Holy Ghost, Lord, as we've lifted up your name in worship and in praise and in adoration, Lord, we've just sent such a wonderful moving and such a marvelous blessing. And God, tonight we're about to embark upon what is essentially the absolutely most important aspect of any church gathering, of any fellowship meeting, of any time that God's people would come together. It's not the singing. Lord, it's not the music. It's not even the prayers that we pray. But Lord, the most important function of the church is, as the Apostle Paul said, preach the word. Amen. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word. And Lord, tonight, if ever there has been a need within the church of God universal for faith, we need it tonight. We need it now. We need it in our hearts. For God, the enemy, would come against us like a flood. He would come against us like an onslaught from hell. He would raise up every wall and every obstacle, every barrier that he can raise in an effort to prevent the church of the Most High from accomplishing all that we might accomplish in the wonderful, victorious name of Jesus. But Lord, tonight we're asking that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon us Lord, anoint this messenger tonight. Anoint this simple word of exhortation. For your word promises that the anointing breaks the yoke. Hallelujah. Whatever burden we've come in with, whatever trouble we face tonight, whatever turmoil Satan throws our way, tonight we can leave with that turmoil broken. We can leave delivered. We can leave free. We can leave lighter, God, delivered by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And Lord, we ask tonight that you'd anoint your word. Help it to bring forth fruit unto righteousness in the ears of every hearer. For we ask it, O oh God, in the lovely name of Jesus. Praise God, amen, and amen. Praise God, and amen. A lot of people want to believe in God. A lot of people want to blame God for everything. I've met so many people that say, Preacher, how can I believe in a God? When there are earthquakes and famines and tornadoes and hurricanes and all kinds of natural disasters that take human life and cause such misery all over the world, how can I believe in a God that would allow such things to occur? And then I know some who say, I cannot believe in a God who would allow a murderer to butcher a child and butcher that child's mother and leave them for dead in the basement somewhere and set a house on fire and how so many evil people in this world can perform so many evil acts. How can there genuinely be a good and gracious and loving God when there are so many evil people that are allowed to act so evil? And my friend, my answer to you tonight is simply this. If you are to understand that there is a God, if you are to believe tonight that God indeed genuinely exists, and I tell you the Word of God tells us that if we are to come to God, if we are to know God, that first of all we must believe that He is. Amen. It's very simple. If you want to genuinely come to a knowledge of God, all you need first do is come to a place where you conceptualize and you believe that he merely exists. It's not so hard. God doesn't make it hard on us. But the Bible goes on to tell us not only that we believe he exists, but also that we believe he is a rewarder of them that diligently, you hear me tonight, that diligently seek him. A lot of people expect God to reward their half-hearted 
mild efforts at finding Him. A lot of people expect God to bless their meek and mild and less than effort-filled attempts at learning more about Him. So many people tonight want to learn about God on their terms, and they want to do it in their way. And they don't want to put any more energy nor any more effort into it than they have to. And yet the Bible said that He is a rewarder of them that what? that diligently seek Him. Hallelujah. If you want to know God, if you want to find God, if you want to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, you'd better be diligent. Amen. You'd better put some effort into this thing. Thank God. You better not just sit on your laurels and expect God to come to you. But the promise of God is this. If we draw nigh unto God, He will will draw nigh unto us. Hallelujah. But it's our move. It's important that we first understand we must first make the effort to draw nigh to God. So many today are not in service because they felt that this particular weekend something else was going on that was more important than their pursuit of God. My, my. So many are not here tonight because something else was competing for their time, and they felt that their relationship with Jesus Christ was less important than another function going on elsewhere in our region. But my friend, I'm here to tell you, like old brother Daniel, it pays to be consistent. It pays to be persistent. It pays tonight to be diligent, to do what you're doing and not do it half-hearted, but do it with all of your might. Hallelujah. And tonight I'm here because while there may be other activities that would cry out for my time and my attention, I have made a vow, I have made a commitment, I have made up my mind that I'm going to serve the Most High God. That when the time comes that God's people are called to the table, I'm the first one to sit down and let God load up my plate with His blessing and with His Holy Ghost promise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Now I'm here to tell you tonight, if you will believe that there is a God, you must also understand that there is another entity. There is another force. There is a, another side of the coin, as it were. For you see, the Bible tells us that one angel allowed himself to become so exalted in his own mind as he occupied the very throne room of God. The word of the Lord tells us that Lucifer was the covering cherub. Why, he was designed with all manner of musical instruments as part of his inner working. He was a creature that was designed in every conceivable way, visually, audibly, in every tangible, conceivable way. He was designed to bring glory and majesty to his Creator. And he was the one angel that God allowed to literally set over and oversee the very throne room of God's grace. And yet, because of his beauty, because of his splendor, because of the lovely, wonderful manner in which God had created him, Lucifer began to question in his own mind, and he began to fathom in his own spirit that he did not need God, but rather he could be God. He said, I do such a wonderful job bringing glory to God and majesty to the Lord. Why should I bring it to him? when I could just occupy the throne and receive the glory and receive the majesty unto myself. And Jesus Christ later declared in the New Testament, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Amen. For I'm here to tell you, my friend, 
that there is no sin. There is no pride. There is no evil that can occupy the presence of Almighty God. And some say God threw him out of heaven. That's not what Jesus said. Hallelujah. He said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning. Glory to God. When his pride began to exalt him above the very glory of God himself, it was as though he tied a lead brick to his foot and that pride dragged him down from that place of glory and majesty and brought him down to this terrestrial plane where he was to exist as a created being that no longer had access to the throne of God that no longer would serve the function God had designed him to serve. And since that time, it has been the intention of that same Satan to bring down God's creation and to destroy every human soul he can destroy. And the unfortunate thing about the workings of the enemy he does not come to us in his truest form. He does not appear to us as some ugly beast like we might see in some movie. He does not appear to us as some gigantic dragon breathing fire with fangs dripping blood. But rather, the Bible teaches us that he works through and operates through humankind. Amen. Why, if Satan had his way... He would have all of mankind turning upon itself like a bunch of cannibals. And we would destroy one another emotionally. We would destroy one another financially. We would destroy one another physically. We would destroy one another spiritually. It, the Bible declares Jesus Christ said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Satan's only purpose in the world today is destructive. And when he is beginning to operate, when he has begun to gain a foothold in our life, there become, there, we begin to manifest destructive behaviors. We begin to manifest destructive actions. And we read in the story of Daniel how that there was a wonderful blessing that came upon Daniel. How Daniel was a captive to another kingdom. He had been taken away from his homeland. And yet he faithfully served the God of his forefathers as he did before the captivity. And yet in spite of Daniel's religious differences, in spite of Daniel's convictions, and in spite of Daniel's absolute belief in one singular God, the God of Israel... The king who sat over Daniel, King Darius, looked upon Daniel with great favor. He admired Daniel. He appreciated Daniel. And the word of the Lord tells us he rewarded Daniel. Amen. Making him the number one man in all of the kingdom, second only to himself. I got news for you children. If you think the only way you can get anywhere in this life, if you think the only way you can gain favor with your family, if you think the only way you can gain favor with your boss at work, if you think the only way you'll ever make a decent living or you'll ever have a decent quality of life is to compromise your convictions and put your spirituality and your experience with God and your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ on a back burner in an effort to appease man. I'm here to tell you tonight you are wrong, amen. And you're going about it all wrong. If you want the blessing, if you want the glory, if you want those things that God has promised, saying, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. If you want that more abundant life, it does not come through compromise. It comes through consistency. It comes through conviction. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Daniel was blessed 
by Darius because the quality of his character was pure and the quality of his character was flawless. You want your boss at work to respect you? Then when you say, I cannot work on Sunday because I've made a commitment to be in the house of God. And when that boss comes to you, as the devil always will, I'm not calling your boss the devil. A lot of times Satan operates through people and they don't even know Satan's operating through them. Amen. But he wants to test our resolve. He wants to test our commitment. He wants to test and try our convictions. And when that boss comes to you and says, you want to work Sunday? I know you can use the money. I know you need some more extra hours. The best answer you can give is fine. Then give them to me on Saturday. Then give them to me on Monday. Give them to me on Tuesday. I'll take them on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. But honey, you aren't going to touch my Sunday because that's the Lord's day. And I've told you before as I tell you now, I've made up my mind to serve God. And on the Lord's day, I'm in the Lord's house. Hallelujah. And some say, well, my boss will fire me. Don't you bet on it. I have known more Christians in my life who stood for their principles and stood for their convictions. And in the end, they were more blessed. They were more gifted. They had more to show for their efforts and for their labor than those worldly people who did not fear God nor know God who would give the world everything it asked of them. Amen. But like old brother Daniel, if you really want to be blessed, you need to stand for something. Come on now. Amen. You need to stand up for Jesus. And when the hour comes, that all darkness has come in around your ears and all hope would seem gone. If you'll stand up for him now, he'll stand up with you later. Amen. Amen. Praise God and amen. You see, Satan began to operate through some of the men around Daniel. And you say, Brother Mora, how can you say Satan operated through these men? You see, it was an issue of pride and ego. Their pride was hurt. Why, Daniel is a foreigner. He's a captive. He's not even one of our nation. And yet old King Darius has set him up above all the nations, second only to himself. We've got to find a way to bring old Daniel down. Don't you know tonight the enemy will indeed work through people around you? Oh, sometimes they will connive and scheme and try to think of a way to trip you. They'll try to think of a way to make you falter. They'll try to make a way for you to fall out of the good graces of those whom God has given you favor with. And yet the answer once again is not compromise. It's conviction. The answer once again is not to cave in, but rather it is to make your commitment stand. Amen. And they went to the king, and unbeknownst to him, not knowing that they were setting Daniel up for a fall, they said, King, let us set up a decree that no man should seek the favor or the assistance of any god or any man except you for the next 30 days. And the king, rather flattered by this notion, you see, Satan was working in the king as well. For pride again was at work. Ego again was at work. It doesn't always look evil, does it? It doesn't, the intention always doesn't look so bad, does it? But my, how the mighty have fallen. So old King Darius says, fine, let us set up such a decree. 
And according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, once this thing has been signed into law, once the decree has been read in the public assembly, it cannot be changed or altered. And anyone who should break this decree, it was said, should be cast into a den of lions. There where they would be pounced, pounced and eaten by hungry lions who are set aside for this very purpose. Well, my friend, the Bible tells me in Daniel chapter 6 how that Daniel, when he knew, remember earlier I made a point of this, when Daniel knew that the decree was signed, Some would try to say, oh, Daniel, he was caught off guard. He didn't realize what was going on. Oh, yes, he did. For the Word of God declares when Daniel knew that the writing was signed. Verse 10. He went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, his homeland. Oh, praise God, the capital of his spiritual walk with God. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Even though Daniel knew that what he was about to do was against the law for the next 30 days. It didn't matter to him. Why? Because Daniel was committed to his relationship with God. Amen. How many of us went and cave in every time something comes down the pike that would seem to contradict our convictions and our beliefs? How many of us immediately cave in and give in to the edict of the enemy when God would desire that we stand for him so that in our darkest hour he might stand with us? I want to keep this word brief tonight. Those men who had set about all this to set Daniel up went to the king and made the declaration that Daniel had been caught in the act, praying and worshiping his God as he had prior to the decree being signed. Interestingly enough, Daniel made no secret of it. For the Bible said that when he prayed and gave thanks, he did so in front of an open window facing Jerusalem the same way he had done before. Amen. Oh, praise God. I'll tell you what, my friend, the day may come when the government says we don't like your kind of church and we've decided that freedom of religion is okay so long as it falls within the parameters of what we accept and what we approve of. But aside from that, we don't much like your sort of religion. We don't like your kind of church meetings. My friend, they can put a chain on the door of the church and lock God's people out. But they cannot put a chain on the doors of the hearts of God's people and keep us from finding and creating and making a sanctuary and shouting the high hosannas of God as we did aforetime. And my friend, I'll not do it in secret. I'll not run underground. I'll not dig a hole for the church. But hallelujah, let's get out in front of our chained up church buildings. Let's get out in that parking lot and let the world know you can lock us out, but you cannot lock God in. Hallelujah. We're going to worship him as we did aforetime, and we'll do it with the window open. We'll let you see us. We'll let you know where we stand and where our convictions lie. <laughs> Some say, Brother Mora, that'll never happen. Don't bet on it. I don't know if you read the paper or watch the news, but my friend, the religious liberties and freedoms of Christian people in particular in this country are under attack and have been for a number of years. And we are slowly losing our battle 
to worship the Lord Jesus Christ and preach this great truth with the same liberty and freedom that our forefathers enjoy. And we'd best be committed now. We'd best be consistent now. For if we cannot stand in this hour of light adversity, however will we stand when we're looking down the lion's mouth? Amen. Praise God. Amen. I love this story of Daniel, and I'm going to try and sew it up as quickly as I can. I love the story of Daniel, for when Darius is presented with the knowledge that Daniel has broken the law and therefore, according to his own decree, must be thrown to the lions, my Bible tells me that the king in verse 14 was very displeased with himself. He realized that his pride and his ego and his arrogance had placed someone he admired and respected in a place of great distress. And you know, my friend, tonight there will be those in this world whom God will give you favor with if you'll stand up for Him. And if it should ever come that somehow, some way, they fall into a position that would bring hurt or injury to you, you'll be amazed how quickly they will be the first one to apologize and repent of their deed because they're so unhappy that they have put you in a position of injury or harm. And I would tell you tonight, the Bible declares in verse 16, that this king was so impressed by Daniel's consistency in serving his God and his conviction that he made a declaration to Daniel saying, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Praise God. Amen. As Daniel was lowered into the den of lions, and as the stone was placed upon the mouth, there was old Darius saying, Daniel, please don't worry. That God you've been so faithful to, that God I have seen you serve so consistently will not fail you. Don't you know tonight, my friend, that when you serve God like you ought to serve God, even the world will know you're going to come out unscathed in the end. You hear what I'm saying? You don't need the church to tell you. You don't need the pastor to tell you. But my friend, there will be those who don't even know God like you know God who are going to speak words of encouragement to you simply on the strength of your testimony, of your consistency, of your conviction. Amen. I've gone through trials in my life. When I started my very first church, my father loves to work on Satan's payroll sometimes. He was a very abusive man as I was growing up, and nothing has changed, not one bit since. And as I was pastoring my first church, I started my first church in the same community I grew up in. Everybody knew me. I was only 18 years old when I started my first church. Didn't know anything about starting a church. And then I got word one day from a man who was a barber in town, and he called me at home. I'll never forget it. He said, Chuck, I just wanted to call you and tell you something. I said, yes. He said, your father was in the shop the other day. And he said, and he was saying all kinds of evil things about you. He was telling us that you were nothing but a charlatan. That all you were out for was money. That you preached as a facade and you're a fake and a fraud and that the ministry is just a money-making scheme and blah, blah. Well, that was rather funny considering I was starting a brand new church. And I don't know about anybody, if you've never been involved in a brand new church, there ain't no preacher I know making money, I'll tell you right now. Any money I got my hands on was going into the church. But my father was sullying my reputation and doing everything in my power to destroy my reputation and to destroy my efforts 
to build a church in that community. Well, my friend, this barber man I'd grown up with all my life, he cut my hair from the time I was a kid. He said to me, but I want to tell you something. He said, we all know you. You grew up in my barber chair. He said, ever since you were this high, you used to tell me you were going to preach the gospel. You used to tell me that Jesus loved me. You used to tell me that this Pentecostal message that you believed was the way to God and that it was real, it was genuine, and that he, I needed to get hold of it in my own life. And he said, I've got a brother that has since become an elder in the Jehovah's Witness movement. And he said, but I've seen your, I'm going to reword it a little bit. He said, I've seen your fire burn. I've seen your testimony burn for all these years. He said, and oh, how I wish my brother was a Pentecostal instead of a Jehovah's Witness. Hallelujah. He said, because, son, there's something about you that's real, and anybody that knows anything about you knows that. Amen. He said, I just wanted to call and tell you, I don't care what you hear. I don't care what somebody tells you your father has said. I don't care what he might do or say to try to sully your reputation and to destroy your integrity. He said, son, anybody that knows you knows you're for real. Hallelujah. I was looking down the mouth of the lion. And old King Darius was saying, don't worry. Your consistency and your faithfulness will pay off. Amen. Praise God. Amen. In verse 18, the Word of God declares that as Daniel is in the lion's den that night, old King Darius could not sleep. He could not eat. He was not interested in hearing music. Anything that would bring lightness to his heart, he wasn't interested in. For he was concerned about that man whose life now lay in the hands of his God. And all night Darius lie in his home, his palace, waiting for the sun to come up and a new dawn to break and a new day to come upon them so that he might go to that lion's den and see what the end of Daniel might be, what the result of Daniel's faithfulness might have been. And the Word of God declares in verse 20, that as the sun rose and a new day dawned, the king ran to that old den of lions. And this king must have really had confidence in Daniel's God. He must have really had confidence in Daniel's relationship with his God. Elsewise, he would have assumed Daniel was dead. But rather, he said this, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God. Oh, hallelujah. They're shouting music right here. Is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? He said, Oh, Daniel, are you down there, boy? Was I right when I said that your God would deliver you from these old lions in spite of my ego and my pride? bringing this potential destruction upon you. Was I right, Daniel? Was I right? Hallelujah. All of a sudden, from the midst of the growling, snarling voices of the lions, old oh, King Darius heard a voice cry out, perhaps yawning, perhaps whiting, uh, wiping the sleepiness from his eyes. And oh, he heard a voice say, O oh, king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocence was found in me. And also before thee, O oh, king, have I done no hurt. 
Oh, hallelujah. Oh, my friend, when the world says, don't worry, Brother Mara, your God going to take care of you because I've seen how consistent you've been. Amen. Brother, when your unsafe family members look at you and say, don't worry, Jeff, God's going to take care of you. Amen. There's not a condition in the world come against your health that God ain't going to see you through. Why? Because you've been faithful. Amen. It doesn't matter what the lion's mouth might be tonight. It doesn't matter tonight what the dilemma might be that you face. Uh, glory to God if you have lived and if you have been consistent in your service toward the Master, you can have confidence tonight that God will not fail you. Hallelujah. And I don't care whether the issue is HIV or AIDS or what it is, cancer, lung cancer. It doesn't matter what it is. The fact of the business and the reality tonight is if you'll make up your mind to make God first, if you'll live for the Lord with conviction and consistency, if you'll pursue your relationship with the Lord with fervor and effort and energy, God will stand with you as you stand before the mouth of the lion. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In closing tonight, I know this has been a very simple word of exhortation. My Bible said that Satan, like a roaring lion, roams to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. I find that scripture interesting. For anyone who has ever scientifically examined the hunting prowess and the hunting practices of the big cats, lions, tigers, jaguars, cougars, whatever they might be, panthers, bobcats, mountain cats, whatever kind, anyone who knows anything about the hunting practices of the lion knows that a hunting lion makes no noise. Amen. A lion on the prowl does not run around growling. Amen. Because he wants to sneak up upon his prey. He wants to be able to employ the element of surprise. He wants to come in under the cover of the tall grass or the brush and he wants to be able to suddenly appear to the weak and the infirmed and those that are older and unable to move as swiftly as the rest of the herd. And he wants to be able to take advantage of that disabled one by suddenly appearing and surprising them and not giving them an opportunity to run. Oh, but our enemy tonight... <laughs> The Bible said to know your adversary, the devil. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight how Satan works. He's got a big mouth. <laughs> Do you remember the old Honeymooners television show? Ralph Crandon would get himself in trouble after trouble after trouble. And he'd always wind up saying to his wife, I got a big mouth, right? And our enemy tonight has a big mouth. He loves more than conquering his prey through the element of surprise. His pride loves to be fed by his ability to strike fear into the hearts of those he would destroy. You're out in the jungle and somewhere in Africa. Suddenly you hear the growl and the snarl of a hungry lion. And it's enough to make anybody grab for their gun. Amen? It's a fearful thing. It's a scary thing. And tonight our enemy is an interesting duck. Because unlike the wise hunter king of the jungle. Old Satan sometimes, most of the time, wants more than anything to side rail God's people by doing nothing more than making a big noise. Come on now. 
Sometimes when the doctor walks in and said, you've got a week to live, you've got cancer, you are HIV positive, what 